This week on The Futurists, Gunjan Bagla. Indian entrepreneurs have been able to establish a way around the bureaucracy and they know how to move things fast. Welcome back to yet another episode of The Futurists, where we interview the people who are thinking about and designing and planning and building the future, the world of the future. I'm Rob Tursik, and I'm with my favorite person in the world who I spend so much time with. My it co-host, seems like that, doesn't King. it? Yes. Yeah, I'm hey, happy to hey, see hey. you yet again, Brett. Welcome back to the future. Thanks. This have, week- you, by the, have you seen that um, someone mocked up a trailer for Back to the Future 4? Have you seen that? No, I have not. It's like the you know Marty goes missing and his son is looking for him. It's quite interesting. Anyway, <laughs> sidetrack, but yeah, so <laughs> random thought bubble. Uh, this week, <laughs> I want to talk about a topic that, frankly, should be getting a lot more attention and and rarely does, at least in the United States, in the weird filter bubble of American media, where we hear so much about China always, and of course these days we China, know a lot about China. Russia. Yeah, and always it's framed as like, you know, a threat or the opposition or something. I find that very tedious, right? Because that is a very uh, narrow way to define our relationship uh, globally. And um, and so this week, I thought it'd be kind of fun for us to have a guest who can talk to us about something that's often overlooked, but really it's a big, 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 big topic. It shouldn't be overlooked at all. And so our guest this week is uh, is someone who is helping Americans understand better opportunities in India. So let's welcome right, Gunjan cool. Bagla. Gunjan, welcome to the show. It's great to have you here. Thank you so much, Rob and Brett, for having me. And Gunjan is awesome. the uh, the CEO of Amrit Consulting, and he's based here in Los Angeles. That's how we've met, and that's how I know him. Um, but a big part of what he does is build bridges between American organizations and Indian organizations, and he knows all about what's happening in India. Now, if you don't mind, let me start with a little bit of a rambling anecdote here, because uh, for a period of time, I lived in Hong Kong. And while I was there, um, the management of my company was very focused on China. This is in the early 1990s. So that made good sense. But candidly, I was a lot more interested in India. And every opportunity I had, I went over to India to visit, to spend time, to go on vacation. I ended up working there. And I just loved it. I enjoyed the heck out of it. And um, I was uh, I enjoyed it because at that moment in time, India had not yet fully uh, industrialized. So there was a lot of the traditional uh, India that was still available to see. You could experience it. You know, uh, when I would travel around in Rajasthan, there were plenty of camels on the street and yeah. goat carts and old fashioned cars and so forth. And I know probably for people in India, that stuff was a little bit quaint, but maybe maybe not that cool. But as a visitor, it really struck me as being like really authentically Indian. And I was I really appreciated it. Uh, I love that country very much. And then um, just a few years ago, right before the pandemic, I had the opportunity to visit um, Kolkata. And of course, this first thing you notice when you arrive is this gigantic superhighway they're building. Yeah. And, uh, and that's happening all over India now. So what's happened in the ensuing 20 or 30 years is India is starting to emerge as a global economic player and really rapidly uh, in across all industries is modernizing. So I thought I'd start today with just a couple headlines uh, that came to my attention in just the last week, because it turns out there's a lot happening in India and that's really yeah. gonna be the focus of our show. And then we'll turn it over to you, Gunjan, and we'll start to ask you questions. Um, but you know, Goldman Sachs has just announced that they are shifting client money for investment from China towards India, because they see faster growth potential. Uh, of course, we can talk a little bit about what some of the, the challenging issues facing China are in the near future, but today's show is gonna be more focused on the opportunities in India, but that's a big endorsement. Uh, it's not the only place. So uh, India is building freeways, as I mentioned. Uh, they just opened, uh, the, just opened the first segment of a new eight lane expressway that will connect Delhi and Mumbai, India's two biggest cities. Now today, that route, if you've driven it, I have, I drove a part of that, it's brutal uh, because it's quite narrow, the roads are old yeah. and so forth. So a big, gigantic, uh, kind of American looking super highway is gonna be a really big change. It'll cut the time of that drive in half. Just this week, another major announcement, India's uh, India Airlines, uh, Air India has just acquired 470 new aircraft. And they did deals with both Airbus and with Boeing. And it was smart uh, because they're trying to make a signal, very strong signal 
to the Europeans and to uh, and to the United States that India wants to remain engaged with those countries, uh, that it's going to be a big buyer of technology and equipment from those places. Right. And that's important because there have been some questions in the past year about India's commitment to the West or relationship with the West, because India has been studiously neutral in the uh, conflict in the Ukraine. And so some have started to question that. So this is a big signal from India. And the plan is actually beyond the 470 aircraft they just bought. That is a gigantic order. Uh, the plan is actually to buy 2,000 aircraft in the next 15 years. So India is emerging as a major transportation wow, hub big, in the yeah. world. That's a huge order. Uh, and the United States has a good partnership with India. It's not something you hear about that much. But just in the past week, the White House and also the Prime Minister of India made some announcements about a new initiative, which is the Initiative on Critical and Emerging Technologies. Uh, and that is where uh, Indians and, and the United States will start to align both research, development, academic partnerships, and so forth, as well as industry. Now, it's all not great news. There's also some conflicts and some trouble, as there always is with the growing power, with the country that's emerging. Uh, India and Pakistan share a big border. Uh, those two countries have had conflict in the past, and there's perennial tension between the two countries. Um, now, there was news that broke this week uh, about pollution. Uh, this came in The Economist this week, uh, where pollution crosses the border, uh, particularly in the region called Gujarat, uh, where uh, air pollution is crossing the border. So, you know, pollution doesn't uh, observe the niceties of national boundaries. Right. It goes anywhere. And so it's going to force those two countries to find a way to collaborate to reduce emissions. And then finally, just to bring it all the way back around to China, because China always comes up on this show for some reason, um, there is this tension that's happening uh, up in the roof of the world. Uh, the border between India and China has never really been agreed. Uh, and this is an artifact that dates back to the colonial past. So it's sort of a, uh, there's been a conflict or I guess a contested border in that region forever. Uh, and what China has been doing is, is, quite, is considered quite aggressive by neighboring countries, uh, where they call the line of actual control, the LAC. Uh, the Chinese military has been building roadways there. And it's not just in India, they're also doing the same thing in Bhutan. I visited Bhutan just a couple of years ago, and this was a giant issue for them. They're very concerned about it because they're a relatively small country and economically, they're not quite sure how they can push back as China begins to take land by building roadways and asserting control over land that's disputed, uh, a border that's, and they're doing the same now in India, and that's going to raise the tensions. Now, the difference there is that uh, with India and China, it actually did come to a shooting match uh, not too long ago, uh, where about, a, I think, two dozen Indian soldiers and several Chinese soldiers were actually killed uh, on that border area. So that is a real hot uh, zone. Um, but on the other hand, it is necessary for countries to assert their boundaries. So you're going to see, uh, I guess, both countries flexing their muscles in the future. Anyway, that's a little bit of a roundup of the news from Interesting. India. A lot of stuff happening. Big player on the global scene. And Gunjan, you just shared with me today uh, an interesting chart that showed that India is steadily rising in terms of uh, gross national product or gross domestic product, and it has now displaced the UK and France. And I think it's now emerged as the fourth largest or fifth largest economy. Is that right? Yes, that's right. Uh, uh, the the US, China, Japan, and Germany are larger, uh, mm -hmm. but India in, entered the top ten only in two thousand twelve. So it's been a steady rise over the last, you know, ten or eleven years, and uh, it's it's just nothing short of amazing when you look at that chart. And how is that transforming life on the ground in India, in Indian cities? We're talking a little bit about infrastructure a minute ago. Tell me a little Middle bit class about class growth. Yeah, that's sort of yeah. Stuff, what's yeah. happening with people in India? How are they experiencing that growth? Okay, so first let me say that, and I'm not the first to say it, but for when you think about India, for every truth, I could probably say an equal and opposite truth. Okay, <laughs> so let me let me point out the the positives of what is happening, which is causing this growth. It's driven by entrepreneurs. It is driven by management executives, and the greatest transformation I see is not among the rich Indians, where where there is transformation. It's really among the lower middle class. Okay, people who were struggling before. And now, with the power of the smartphone, some of them are Uber drivers, and they are making much more money than they did than 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 they did before. Okay, rural women suddenly, when they are empowered with a phone, you know, they can talk to their sisters across other villages. They can talk to a physician. 
and suddenly they discover the power of birth control and they stop producing babies just because the husband wants more babies or or whatever. So there's a transformation happening at all levels of Indian society. What we hear about in the Wall Street Journal and Forbes is the transformation at the top level, you know, the number of billionaires in India, the number of um, uh, unicorns, and that's true too, but yeah, it's a tremendous transformation. That's exciting to hear. Um, now, how would that affect somebody's life in India? So, you know, we often have in our minds, unfortunately, our images that we get from mass media. And when we see images of India, it always feels like you're watching that film Koyana Squatsi. You know, the images of lots of people hanging off the side of a train or lots of people crowding into a bus. Um, and I don't know if well, that's just accurate. lots of people. Yeah, that's true. Yeah. I don't know if that's an accurate picture today. Certainly the large number of people is. Um, is the infrastructure improving? Uh, roadways being built? Is India leapfrogging into the 21st century? Tell us a bit about that. Uh, yes. So the, you know, India is a crowded country, three, yeah. three times the number of people in the, uh, as the US on one third the land mass. So the cities are very, very crowded. And all homes are now vertical. Even if you are doing very well, you're going to be living like new, like Manhattan. You'll be on the thirtieth floor of a, you know, of a of a skyscraper. Uh, the uh, transformation that is happening is really enabling people to to be able to get better educated, and education is the key for the upper lower class and the lower middle class to success. Okay, so there are millions of ins of instances where somebody graduates with a college degree and they are making more money than their parents put together the next day okay wow. that's a tremendous transformation yeah. driven by knowledge work and also not driven by modern manufacturing facilities that are being put up in india and oh, that's really true. Yeah, and, and and Apple just announced that they're going to relocate about a third of their production of their devices to India. So there's a real uh, illustration of India's rising uh, industrial capability. Right. They will employ at least 50,000 people, not directly. They are through Apple's contractors. Mm -hmm. But in Bangalore and Chennai, they are setting up, a, they have already set up these massive factories. And I've heard that in Bangalore that there's it's it's actually beginning to resemble an American suburban uh, development in some places, you know, where uh, successful entrepreneurs are now buying land and and building kind of suburban communities. Is that accurate or is that overstated? Yeah. So you, Bangalore is still a very crowded city. Yeah. Uh, but the 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 very successful in Bangalore can buy property inside these uh, little islands, if you will. And my, one of my employees lives in a place called Palm Meadows in, uh, you know, uh, just outside. Well, it used to be outside Bangalore. Now it's in the center of the city because the city has grown so much. And once you enter uh, Palm Meadows, you feel like, you know, you might be in uh, in Yorba Linda or, uh, you know, a, a, a local. Uh, I mean, the, they have sloping roofs, although they don't need them. You know, it doesn't <laughs> snow. But uh, the, the, the builders thought that by giving a, uh, appearance of Southern California that they'll get better real estate values. I chuckled. There's also a place called Malibu Meadows or something like that. Oh, how funny! Yes, yeah, so they're building like names that re they resonate. <laughs> they're replicating Southern California. There uh, uh, yeah. is it true that a lot of uh, Indian entrepreneurs who came to the United States to work in technology companies in the 1990s and 2000s, many of them are going back to India now to run businesses there. Is that accurate? I've heard that. I don't know if that's true. Yes, there is there is a significant number of you know of, of Indians who came to the U.S. and have returned. Some of them are engineers and scientists. Some of them are physicians. India's largest corporate hospital chain is owned by a physician who was started by a physician who worked in the U.S. for twenty years and then returned. His daughters now run the company. It's called Apollo Hospitals. Absolutely. Yeah. I think cool. sometimes people fail to understand as well that here in the United States, a number of the leading technology companies are led by people who were born in India, including Google and Microsoft, two of the biggest technology companies on the planet. Uh, okay. So there, there is this tighter integration between the two countries, between the United States and India, than many people might realize, because it doesn't always... And, and yet there's still consistent pressure on the whole H-1B visa system, which is the major um, thing. And if you're on a H-1B, the path to, um, you know, a green card is is challenging. 
you know. Um, and as we saw during the Trump administration, um, you know, there was an attack on H-1B visas yeah. and you know so so uh i mean uh, the us is dependent on these uh, technology workers for sure the, you know we we have uh, what is it 330,000 i think h1b visa holders in in the states so it's a very small number comparative to the value that silicon valley brings to the us but this you know um and we don't train homegrown uh, you know, coders and programmers at the rates we need to fill the jobs in in the US. So we need to import them. I, I still don't understand why it's so hard to um, support immigration from India, particularly for technology workers in the US. But yeah, here it is, right? Yeah, it's uh, the the number the percentage of immigrants who are entrepreneurs in the United States is overwhelming. It's a it's a gigantic percentage, close to half of. Half of the people who immigrate here start a business or have a side hustle. Uh, so that's great entrepreneurial energy. Gunjan, tell me a little bit more about entrepreneurialism in India, because that's a new thing. I remember when I first visited India in 1991, uh, at that time, it was very difficult to start a business. There was a lot of red tape. There was a lot of bureaucracy. There was a lot of government involved. And that prevented small companies from getting going or scaling up. Has that changed? That has changed dramatically. In fact, the change started that very year. In July 1991, India's gold reserves were down to the level where they actually had to, to borrow a tremendous amount of money and ship a whole plane load of gold to the Bank of London as, uh, as a collateral. And that crisis caused the Indian government to restructure within a period of three weeks. Uh, it, was, uh, it was dramatic. It was led by uh, Dr. Manmohan Singh, who was a Oxford-trained economist, and by uh, by uh, Chidambaram, the his 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 colleague, who's a Harvard MBA, so the U.S. had some influence on that change. Uh, that that uh, liberalization has continued through multiple governments, and today it is it is much easier to build and scale a business than it was. It doesn't mean it is easy. It is easier than it used to be. Okay. But Indian entrepreneurs have been able to establish a way around the bureaucracy, and they know how to move things fast. And that is why, for example, if you and I are consuming any generic pharmaceutical medications, I take one for diabetes, for example, and it's made in India. Okay, That's right. Yeah, yeah that's most true. of the People generic medications are, are, are from India today. That's And most of the antibiotics that we take are coming from India yeah, as true. well. That's true. And um, now, how about capital funding? You know, here in the United States, we enjoy ready access to uh, to venture funding. There's a huge amount, records amount of it available. Mm-hmm. Not this year, unfortunately, because yeah. we're in a risk, you know, it's, everyone stepped back a little bit from that. But there's still plenty of venture capital available, uh, although it's regional, right? So it's typically going to be uh, located in cities um, near tech centers. Is that how it works in India, too? Is there now a venture capital scene in India? Yeah, so um, beyond the family and friends kind of funding, uh, India now has a vibrant system of angels, which is still a little immature compared to the U.S. Mm -hmm. There are many American venture capital funds who are present in India, Axel, Kleiner, Sequoia, all of them are there. And now there are Indian venture capital funds as well. Okay, The public markets in India are also strong. The Bombay Stock Exchange started in the 1800s, so it's it's a long history. And uh, then they set up another fully electronic exchange called the National Stock Exchange. So there's plenty of equity capital available. Mm -hmm. Historically, debt capital has been harder to to obtain in India. So even, you know, even the Reliance Group, one of the largest uh, companies in India, the largest group, really, they often come to New York to raise their debt. Their debt. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Interesting. And um, I'm trying to think of like, you know, the, the liquidity is, I guess, the term I'm thinking of, you know, the path to an exit is, is there, um, you know, here in the United States, if you start a business, let's say you're going to go into like, you know, health tech or biotech, yeah. um, there's a number of big organizations that you can hope to exit to, uh, so you can do a trade sale as opposed to trying to take the company public. Does that same dynamic work in India? Do entrepreneurs start businesses and then sell them to a large conglomerate? So this certainly wasn't the case some years ago. In mm-hmm. fact, as recently as I would say six or seven years ago, uh, you know, parents have a huge influence on young people. And 
young, you know, young adults coming out with college degrees wanted to go work for an IBM or a Tata or an Intel. Today, it's the exact opposite. Okay, if you work for one of those large companies, you're considered a fuddy duddy. You know, uh, okay. having you know, getting into a startup is what is in, and that's why there are over a hundred unicorns in India today. Oh, many of them have. Uh, you know, many of the startups have been able to exit. Some have gone public. Some have been purchased, and obviously some have failed as well. So those pathways are building up. I wouldn't say it's as robust as you see in the U.S. There's another mm-hmm. thing that's happening, Robin Brett. Many Indian companies are really looking at global markets today. Right, yeah. that's what a you change. What's happening yeah. with the Israelis, for example? Right, the Israeli startups would come to the U.S., establish a company here, and go public in the U.S. You'll start seeing more and more of that in the next five years, I promise you. Yeah, that's true. And actually Indian people, again, Americans might not be aware of it, but you mentioned Tata and Tata Consulting and Infosys, two big tech consulting companies. They have a huge footprint in the United States. Uh, and, and that process began in the in the late 1990s. I remember when they first came to the United States and people were quite skeptical. Uh, I also remember very clearly in the early 2000s working for a technology company and I suggested to the CEO that we consider outsourcing development in India. And he laughed and he said, we're never going to send our code over to India. But today that's quite common, right? These are things that we rely on every single day. Many, many companies uh, in the United States. So I guess the integration is is invisible, but it's really uh, more tightly integrated than people tend to realize. And part of that is because China steals so much of the thunder. China is always forefront in the United States and not always viewed in an easy way or in a friendly way, more viewed as a potential adversary or a real adversary. Um, well, I think we could go into that in a great amount of detail, but maybe what we should do before we do that uh, is let's do our quick fire round of questions because we want to get to know you a little bit better. This is a way for our audience to understand who they're listening to. And so um, Brett is always my my co-host here who loves to ask these questions of our guests. So uh, Gunjan, yeah. get ready. Because here yeah. it comes. Just, just before we jump into the quick fire round, I will tell you one of, you know, um, I did I visited and spoken at the um, Infosys campus at Mysore. Oh, and that's a lovely is, campus. Yeah, just just incredible, actually. If if that could be applied to infrastructure development more broadly in India, well, just imagine, right? So, incredible campus. But let's get get to the quick fire round. What was the first science fiction you remember being exposed to on TV or media? So there was an American book corner that opened at the public library in Kanpur, where I grew up. And one of the books I was fascinated by was called Opus 100. You know, he was this author who had written 100 books. And of course, it was Isaac Asimov. Ah, yes. He opened my eyes to number theory. He opened my eyes to astronomy. He opened my eyes to science fiction. And I was just entranced and transformed as to how one individual could do all of that. No, he he had an incredible uh, gift for forecasting and thinking about the future, for sure. Um, What technology do you think has most changed humanity? If I look at it from the perspective of India, it is the smartphone more than anything else. The smartphone has revolutionized the way commerce is conducted, the computer to the average Indian is the smartphone. They went from nothing to yes. a smartphone. They didn't go through PCs and laptops and tablets. Okay, So yes. The I think this is what a lot of Americans don't understand. If you look at China, you look at India, you look at Africa and Asia, you know, more broadly now, the, the e-commerce revolution is actually happening through smartphones. You know, all of the new startups and businesses that, you know, we didn't see see that happen during the dot com in in these uh, economies, but we're seeing it now with a smartphone. Um, can you think, um, you know, what is what is the best prediction an entrepreneur or a futurist or a science fiction writer has uh, has made? Do you think in the past? So what? But I, I I'm a mechanical engineer, and I was fascinated by robotics, uh, particularly when when I read Asimov's books about about robotics. And today it is a reality. You know, not only in factories, but now you're seeing robots in other applications. Uh, I, I think uh, robots will continue to improve the the lives of humans everywhere. 
Yeah, just even the three laws of robotics, we're still debating that. That's a that's a good one. Yeah. And finally, um, is there a science fiction story or a, a you know a forecast of the future that represents the future you hope for? That's hard for me to say. Fair mm. enough. Yeah, some of these questions are a bit more abstract, but that's fine. Thanks, Ganjan. I appreciate uh, your answer to those questions. Let's take a quick break. And after the break, uh, let's dive into a little bit more of the trajectory of where the economy in India is going and, and where is it going to add value to the global ecosystem moving forward. You're listening to The Futurists. We'll be right back after this break. Provoke Media is proud to sponsor, produce, and support the Futurist podcast. Provoke.fm is a global podcast network and content creation company with the world's leading fintech podcast and radio show, Breaking Banks. And of course, it's spin-off podcasts, Breaking Banks Europe, Breaking Banks Asia Pacific, and the Fintech Five. But we also produce the official Finnovate podcast, Tech on Reg, Emerge Everywhere, the podcast of the Financial Health Network, and NextGen Banker. For information about all our podcasts, go to provoke.fm or check out Breaking Banks, the world's number one fintech podcast and radio show. Welcome back to The Futurists with uh, your hosts, Brett King and Rob Tursek. Uh, we are speaking with Ganjan Bagla. Um, he is an advocate for uh, Indian commerce and business uh, overseas, sort of basically tying, creating a bridge economically and conceptually between the US and, and India. Ganjan, um, you know, in terms of economic policy, in terms of sort of the political landscape, um, you know what has what has changed over the the last couple of decades. You know, particularly with Modi coming in and some of the changes he's made. Um, you know, I, I, I'm a big fan of the Adar Card, the identity program um, that has created incredible changes in financial inclusion, for example, in India. But from an infrastructure perspective, um, you know, what has led to the acceleration in India's community and the improvement in the economy? in recent years. Yeah, so the day that uh, Narendra Modi was elected, I was in India and the Wall Street Journal called me for a short interview and the line they put on the front page was, India is a big ship, it'll take time to, to change course. Well, that ship has changed course faster than I predicted. Mm -hmm. okay. One reason really is that Narendra Modi was the first chief minister, which is like a U.S. governor, the first chief minister of a state to become prime minister. The states is where the action happens. And Modi had transformed the state of Gujarat economically. Okay, This is the first state that will become a first world uh, kind of yeah. uh, a location. And it was an and, economic powerhouse, uh, industrial powerhouse when he was uh, when he was leading it. Exactly. So he brought that kind of business oriented thinking. In the very first week when he took power, he asked each ministry to make uh, like a five or seven slide presentation, which was unheard of in India. They, you know, they would make a 45 slide presentation and take three months to do it. And the presentation would say nothing at the end of it. So he, he conveyed that business oriented attitude and his immediate cabinet is completely free of any corruption or ne nepotism, mm -hmm. which is the first time I think in India's history that that has happened. So those, those factors led to confidence that Indian executives and business people had to be able to invest and to grow. So uh, you've seen that result. His minister of roads is, you know, has actually made the specific claim that our roads will be as good as American highways all over the country in the next two or three years. And they're delivering on that. You know, they're delivering this, on that, this, yeah, this absolutely. Week. And that was the striking thing in Kolkata was the gigantic flyovers, the overpasses that they were building. They were under construction at the time. Yeah. But you could see the ambition there was to take a Victorian city, a Victorian era city, and turn it into, you know, supersize it and, and turn it into a gigantic city that extends into the neighboring regions, which are mostly agricultural now. So that's a grand vision. Um, and, and, and Modi has been in office as prime minister now since I think 2014, right? So almost 10 years. 2014, yes, yeah. He's the just recently reelected. Yeah, he's just recently reelected, right, for a second term? Four years ago. I mean, yeah, four years ago. It's a five-year term. So next year they will have general elections again. Oh, I see. And well, can, he, he, can he do another term or is he... Uh, yeah, there's term no term limits. limits in India. Okay. 
Yeah. And and this comes in great contrast to uh, the the preceding leadership that in India, you know, India for the longest time was dominated by the Congress Party, and uh, and they had a certain vision of how the the, the uh, country should operate. Um, you know, to its credit, it was a, it was viewed as a, a very multicultural uh, a vision, and and the idea was that India would be a secular democracy. A lot of Americans don't realize that India is the largest functioning democracy in the world. Uh, another reason why the United States should cultivate a good relationship with India. Yeah. Um, but Modi's party, Modi's party is different. Um, so one of the problems that Congress had, I think, is there's a lot of nepotism. You have like literally almost like a dynastic control from uh, Nehru's family on down through the Gandhis, even to this day. Uh, and they run lackluster campaigns, but they haven't been especially responsive to these trends, uh, particularly the globalization trends. Whereas I think BJP has been more responsive. Is that is that an accurate way to frame it? I don't know enough about Indian politics to make that comment. Yeah. So to be fair, the 1991 liberalization happened during Congress rule. Uh-huh. Uh huh. So uh, we, you know, we can't fault Cong- the Congress Party for all of India's problems. And in the early days of India's independence, Nehru took the stance of building out the steel mills, building out uh, the uh, Indian Institutes of Technology, of which I'm a, a fortunate graduate. So they, some long-term things were done very well in yeah. Nehru's uh, first couple of terms, uh, but. The BJP is the business person's party, if you will. And they they understand, I think, how to enable businesses to grow. Uh, so uh, and the other factor is really that entrepreneurs and managers have felt empowered over the last 25 years. Mm-hmm. So regardless of who wins the next election, I don't think India's growth is going to slow. Okay. Now, is there a distinction that Americans might recognize the way we have, you know, uh, Democrats, which are viewed as kind of the party of what well, formerly the party of labor, now the party of big government, I guess. Mm-hmm. And then, uh, you know, the, the, the Republicans here, which is our conservative party, which is more of a business focused party. I'm not sure those distinctions hold up so well anymore post Donald sure. Trump. But nevertheless, mm-hmm. that's kind of historically the way that it splits in the U.S. How does it work in India? How is that? Is that is there like a left and right? Um, to these different parties? So, first of all, India has a multi, m- multitude of political parties. Most of the other parties are regional. So, the state of Tamil Nadu is controlled by the DMK and the ADMK. The Communist Party still has a strong role in the state of Kerala, which has the highest literacy in the country. Okay? Hmm, uh, so, there, there are all of these regional parties. The Congress Party, you know, unfortunately, has been decimated over the last, uh, you know, last several years. So, they are much less powerful today than they were in the old days. Congress got the Congress Party got its power by uniting a bunch of minorities, you know, hmm. both religious minorities as well as the marginalized Hindus, and putting them together. Okay? Mm-hmm. The BJP has taken a different approach. You know where they 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 are really allying with the mainstream Hindus, if you will. Okay. Mm-hmm. So that's the difference that you see. Uh, yeah, so, no, 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 that's a subject of some controversy, right? Because uh, uh, recently uh, people have made the claim that the BJP stands for Hindu nationalism. Um, maybe historically preceding the formation of the BJP party, uh, an, an earlier party might have been more closely identified with that movement. Um, but that there, there's uh, some concern about persecuting uh, Muslim minorities uh, or a rise of, uh, you know, kind of a, um, a Hindu majority uh, dominating, which is different from Nero's original vision of India as a secular society. Uh, and, and recently this all came to a head because the BBC uh, released a documentary that's very critical of Modi. But critics of the BBC have said that this is a very colonialist perspective. It's outdated information. And in fact, there was an investigation of these very same allegations in India that cleared Modi of any wrongdoing. Can you comment a little bit about that for people who might not be familiar with that controversy? Sure. So this relates to incidents that happened back in the early 2000s. Mm-hmm. And it was you know, front page news at that time. Uh, the U.S. government, in fact, had denied a visa to Narendra Modi, uh, you know, uh, uh, following those incidents. But when uh, the 2014 elections were coming about, uh, President Obama, you know, clearly said that if Narendra Modi becomes prime minister, of course, he's welcome to the U.S. Mm. Uh, the I think it's inappropriate for Western media or to always use the word 
Hindu fundamentalist to describe the BJP and Narendra Modi. Uh, that conveys a sense that, you know, there's a degree of almost fascism in India, and that's really not the case. Certainly, mm -hmm. they are closely allied, you know, with with uh, the RSS, for example, which is, uh, you know, uh, the one of the affiliates of the BJP. Uh, there is that thread. Uh, but I think it's it's too simplistic a description mm -hmm. you know, of a complex and textured country like India to be able to apply that label universally. When you see India mentioned in the New York Times or the LA Times, they'll describe the BJP as the Hindu fundamentalist party. Everyone's and, grappling for an analogy. Well, to it's, make a it more, it's an easier way to classify yeah. you know, something if you don't understand it, right? If you don't understand the nuances. People but, want to uh, understand if Modi is like, you know, the the um if he's like Erdogan in in um in in Turkey or Putin in Russia, perhaps on a more extreme level. Right. Uh, is that the case or is that just I don't distortion? think that's fair, yeah. Yeah. So Mo Modi is definitely action oriented. Mm -hmm. And some of that I think looks to people who criticize him within India as well as people from the outside that uh, uh, he may he may not be following the rule of law in certain cases mm -hmm. okay so i think it's a fair concern but it really isn't the primary prism through which people should look at india in my view uh, I, I i think the what is happening to the minorities in india is a significant concern and that has to change I believe it will change after the next elections. Already last week, uh, Narendra Modi reached out to a Muslim minority called the Bora Muslims. You know, they are persecuted. They are Muslims who are persecuted in Pakistan. You know, they live on the border between Pakistan and India. And uh, uh, there, there was some definite action on the part of Narendra Modi to reach out to that community. Mm -hmm. uh, Muslims make mm -hmm. an important part of India's success. The most of the Bollywood stars, you know, people like Shah Rukh Khan, who was in a big movie just two weeks ago called Pathan. Yep. He's Muslim. Uh, the company called Sipla, which is one of the largest pharmaceutical companies in India, is run by a Muslim. You mentioned IT services. Wipro is a company run by a exactly. Zipanji, who's a Bora Muslim. Yeah. Oh, good. Thank you for that correction, because honestly, here we get, uh, I think we get kind of a distorted lens uh, uh, through our news, partly because they're trying to oversimplify these narratives that are so complex. And given India's many different political parties and the vigorous democracy there, you know, people forget how vigorous the campaigning yeah. can be in India if you haven't persisted, seen it or seen it firsthand, uh, then sometimes that narrative uh, becomes too simple. And, and then we're always just trying to classify people or put them into a simple category. Well, let's talk about the implications for the future. So you have uh, you have a vigorous leader, strong leader. Um, you have great economic growth. Um, you have now, you know, increasingly educated uh, and an increasingly optimistic workforce. Yeah. What does the next ten years of India's growth look like? Is India going to displace China? Is India stepping up and finally? Well, gonna India India has already surpassed China in population terms. That's the well. It's going to happen imminently. Mm -hmm. Um, you know, because China's birth rates are amongst the lowest in the world now, thanks to the one mm -hmm. child policy. Um, and so India will become the most populous country in the world. But then when does it become, you know, does it ever become the world's largest economy? That's a really good question. I think it'll be a long while before India's economy becomes comparable to the United States. Okay. However, in 10 to 15 years, uh, India's economy will be close to surpassing Japan and Germany. Whether it wow. happens in 10 years or 20 years, I can't say, but definitely it's going to happen. Japan, Japan's population is declining mm -hmm. and, and Germany is stable. Yeah. So you're going to see that happen. There's another factor we have. Those are the about. third and fourth largest economies in the world right now. So right. that is yeah. no small statement, what you just said. Right. There's another aspect we haven't touched on at all, which is the strategic or you know defense alignment between the United States and India. Yes. If there is ever a conflict between, you know, between China and the U.S., if China ever invades Taiwan, for example, okay, and I hope that never happens, but the State Department and the Department of Defense are preparing for those those possibilities. The best ally that the United States can have in that area is India. 
Okay? Yeah, and there are many strategic reasons for it. If you look at Singapore and the Straits of Malacca, where 30% of world trade goes through a 17-mile strait, you know, what people don't realize is that the Andaman and Nicobar Islands in the Bay of Bengal, which are owned by India, are right next to that point. So a military presence of India is there. I can visualize in the next 10 or 15 years that India may consider the possibility of a joint base with, with the United States at that point. You know, mm. at that point. Yeah. There's, now, a, yeah, there's a, a, a strong chance in the future that the U.S. is going to try and reduce China's economic um, success by by doing blockades using the military, particularly in the South China Sea. That's, I right. think, a, a fairly um, strong possibility. Ge- geopolitically, if, if, it gets sort of interesting. But yeah, if well, there's a if there's a shooting war, that would be the U.S.'s approach. We would cut off the trade routes with the Navy, as opposed to trying to block. But even. China. Even when China, you know, we've had this debate on the show, like Mm -hmm. when China surpasses the U.S. as the world's largest economy, the U.S. is going to treat this with disbelief. And, you know, if they don't have the economic levers to impact China's, you know, trade, and if China is, you know, ramping up trade globally, then the U.S. may find an excuse to um, use military intervention because it's the biggest, you know, stick that they have, right? Right. Yeah. Wow, that's a pretty extreme scenario. Um, but you know, I think what the United States has learned in the in, in Vietnam and and in the Korean War, and hopefully relearned more recently, is that it's extremely difficult, even for the world's biggest superpower, to project force halfway around the world. It's just extremely difficult to sustain it, maintain it, and run a country by remote control. We haven't been particularly successful at it. Uh, and to, and to maintain global security, we need partners. Uh, it works far better for the United States when we work in partnership. And what I'm hearing you say, Gunjan, is that there's a great opportunity for the United States to develop a better partnership with India. Now, yeah, I think India, it's a necessity, Rob. Um, yeah. there, there are two forms in which it is happening today. You might have heard of the Quad. The Quad is... Yes, I have heard of the Quad. Tell me about the Quad. Yeah. Japan, Australia, India, and the United States getting together mm. for what they call a free and open Indo-Pacific. And the word Indo is significant in that. I had not heard the term Indo-Pacific un- until about 10 years ago. Yeah, I think it was is. invented by the State Department to replace Asia-Pacific. And it's really to make a specific point to China that we yeah. are talking about India as being included. And you know the Indo-Pacific ends at the western borders of India. Okay. Yeah, that makes sense. Oh, so the quad is like the four points on the on the compass there, east, west, north, and south, uh, right. to define that Indo-Pacific region. It is true. We talk about Southeast Asia. We talk about non-China Asia or ex-China Asia. Uh, we talk about the South Pacific. We talk about these regions a lot, but we don't use that term Indo-Pacific often. But it's a nice idea to include India as kind of like the Western bound on that um, uh, in that region. Well, I, I get even frustrated that um, you know, people in the states identify people from India as Asian, right? Because I think that's too simplistic uh, uh, classification. And right. you know, um, yeah. but you know, I mean, that's just me. But let's get big picture, Gunjan. Sure. You know, let's get, take us out thirty years. What's India going to be like? So thirty years from now, India will be a developed country. It won't look much like the United States, I don't think, because you know, the size of the country is different. But in terms of economic power and scale, uh, people even in the lower middle class will have the resources to travel internationally. People in the poorest uh, echelons of Indian society will live a comfortable life. Uh, the the life expectancy will go up. The population growth will be stable. So India's population will no longer be growing. And the U.S. and India will be the close, two closest, I don't want to use the term ally, because that implies a defense-related uh, uh, thing, but in terms of trading partners. You know, trade and um, people-to-people connections. You know. And one other thing that enables that, by the way, is the Boeing 787. Okay, I don't know if you've flown to India uh, on, on the 787, it's a completely different experience when you go on such a long flight and mm. the, the airplane is humidified and it, you know, it's uh, pre- pressurized at a lower altitude level. You arrive in India and you can work the same day, which I could uh-huh. never do until the 787. Okay. Now, the so when, when instead of flying through Dubai or 
or London, you can have nonstop flights between the two countries, then being halfway around the world is not such a hassle anymore. It's no further than Japan or Singapore or, or Australia from Los Angeles. Uh, what about in terms of industry specifically, where the investment's going? Obviously, you know, there's been a lot of outsourcing of things like, um, you know, call center operations and so forth. But, you know, that that's being going to be replaced by artificial intelligence. Clearly, so where do you see the, um, you know, industrial advantages that India has? So, in India is already a manufacturing powerhouse. Most of what is manufactured in India is consumed by India. But in 30 years, India will be as viable as China or even more viable to be able to produce a vast range of goods. Okay, I'm already seeing those trends happening today. In chemicals, India is very strong. Yeah. In pharmaceuticals, we've already talked about it. In engineering goods, if you if you go to AutoZone to, or Pep Boys to get your radiator or battery or you know uh, uh, alternator replaced, there's a very high chance that the product was made in India. The largest metal forging company in the world is actually Bharat Forge, located in Pune, in Western India. Uh, we are already seeing that kind of scale. So you will see India becoming much more familiar to Americans than it is today. And uh, the other area we haven't talked about is the entertainment industry. Right. right now, Hollywood, it's own thing. Bollywood, it's, it's its own thing. By the way, more people watch Bollywood movies than they watch Hollywood movies. Okay, It's just yeah. that those movies are cheap and they're seen all over Africa and Asia and Russia and China. Uh, did but you, Rob, so did you check out RRI yet? Yeah, yeah. yeah. Movie? That's an example. That's always like the first telltale sign. Is um, when a, when the film breaks on on Netflix, you know you know that that nation is starting to step up to the global stage when it yeah. comes to entertainment export. Next, we'll get a boy band or some sort of like girl pop band from from Bombay. I pop, yeah, yeah. <laughs> absolutely. They they haven't looked towards the West because the market they have is so large. Yeah, the movies like RRR, they were. Yeah. I think they specifically planned to have something yeah. in there to appeal to the West and. It yeah. won a Golden Globe for the song, and now yeah. it's nominated for an Oscar. It's true. Oh, well, and yeah. also, you know, films like Slumdog Millionaire do break out, right? And that's not a new film at all. So that just shows you that quietly, once again, it's another place where India's been overlooked. It's present, it's growing. Uh, but when you travel in Africa and in the Middle East and in Central Asia, Indian culture is very popular, right? So there's a giant export territory there. Hey, Gunjan, tell me a little bit about India's neighbors, uh, because India, you know, um, it's a it's a growing economy, but on the global stage, you point out there's room for growth. But in its immediate area in South Asia, India yeah. is dominant. It's a gigantic colossus sure. there south of China. So, is the relationship with neighboring countries uneasy, tense? Is there uh, are there partnerships? Do you see that as an area for conflict or in our area for partnership and growth in the future? So, India has the unfortunate situation of two large hostile countries on its northern borders, Pakistan on one side mm. and China on the other. However, uh, India's other neighbors are very friendly with, with the country. Bhutan, you mentioned, Nepal, Sri Lanka, Bangladesh. They are all very friendly. And India created or helped create this entity called SARC, the South Asian uh, Regional Cooperation Council. Afghanistan is also part of it. Okay, uh, the, the all of those countries have considerable trade and understanding between them. The people of Pakistan are the same as the people of India. When I meet a Pakistani American here, we yeah. can talk about everything in the same manner. It's no. It's like Aussies and New Zealanders. You know, we okay. we we ha we hang it on each other when we're back there, but when we're offshore, we're like neighbors. Yeah, 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 absolutely. Um, so when Modi was elected prime minister, one interesting thing that he did is he invited the heads of all of those countries to his, you know, the equivalent of his inauguration. Mm -hmm. okay. And even the prime minister of Pakistan came to that event. Okay. So good. And he was really, uh, you know, extending an olive branch. Yeah. You know, I'd like to be friendly with all of you. War and hostility doesn't help us. Okay. The challenge in Pakistan specifically is that the country is run by the generals. The democ so-called democracy in Pakistan is maintained primarily for the convenience of the United States, to be very blunt. 
All the power rests with the generals. They can replace the prime minister anytime, as you've seen happen in you know successively over the last many years. Uh, and, and that's why that country is unstable. So if I look at the India of 30 years from now, I hope that Pakistan would not have become a failed state. Mm -hmm. And somehow if there's some peace there, both countries will benefit. The people of Pakistan are suffering because of this. So well, there's a need you know, that, to, to so, elevate the local economies, uh, neighboring economies as well. Otherwise, that yeah. creates a uh, risk, a, a geostrategic yeah. risk for India. Yeah. So one thing India has always done is whenever there's a disaster in any one of these countries, they yeah. will send aid immediately. That's right. In fact, you saw that with Turkey two weeks ago. Yeah, that's exactly India, right. India sent seven C-17s, Boeing yeah. seven C-17s made in Long Beach, California, by the way. <laughs> okay. uh, they sent seven C-17s full of you know, goods and personnel to help with Turkey, even though Turkey has been very critical of India in the past, and they've mm -hmm. sided with Pakistan. Okay? So when there are floods in Pakistan or earthquakes, India sends aid, you know, no questions asked. Mm. Very yeah. Interesting. Well, you know, given given what they had last year, it was a real challenge. And that leads us to the final question for today, um, it, which is, what's the climate response plan that's emerging in India? Because particularly in southern India, like um, Bangladesh, uh, we are going to have major flooding problems where the climate is going to ha have a, a impact on a very large population of people. Sure. So uh, the recognition that climate change is real, you know, is widespread within the Indian leadership, the political leadership. India has committed to the goals of the Paris Climate Accord. And it's a real tough thing for India to do. Yeah. Because most of the energy is produced by either coal or imported oil. Okay. When Modi came to power, one of the things he did, he looked at, they looked at the solar energy goals of the previous government and essentially more than doubled them. Okay? They were projecting some 20 gigawatts by 2020 and the country has blown through those. Yeah, they're going to be at 100 gigawatts or something very soon. Okay? Mm -hmm. They're building the world's largest solar farms now, larger than the ones in any other country in the states yeah. of Rajasthan, Gujarat, where there's plenty of land and sunshine. This is fantastic. Yeah. yeah. So India is also making a commitment now to nuclear which the Modi government has pretty much left alone for the last nine years. And now they are reinvigorating the growth of uh, nuclear energy with heavy water plants inland and light water plants on the coast. The light water plants so far have been built by Russia. But there is there is a hope for Westinghouse to be able to, to build their, take their technology to India. And I yeah, think China great. has some 30 Westinghouse plants now, uh, mm -hmm. but India doesn't have any yet. Uh, quite an interesting yeah. thing. Uh, the the future of energy is a whole other topic for us today. Well, Gunjan, thank you very kindly for joining us this week on The Futurist. It's always a pleasure to see you and speak to you. Uh, I've enjoyed your insights on, uh, on Asia in general. You've shared so many interesting things with me. So thank you for that. This show is great because you disabused us of some notions that we have, uh, some popular notions, maybe press notions, media notions that we have. Uh, maybe sometimes the reality of India escapes our notice. So you were able to correct some of that. I hope that was helpful for our audience. So thank you very much for joining us on the show today. Thank you, Brett. Thank you, Rob. How can people find you or track you or hear about your thoughts? What's the best way for them to follow you? So I'm on LinkedIn and I'm the only Gunjan Bagla in the world, so I'm easy to find there. Uh, <laughs> my website is at amrit.com. And lately I even have a TikTok account at India Expert. There you go. India expert. That's a good uh, that's a good handle, man. Well done. Right on. Well, thank you for joining us on The Futurists. And thank you, Brett. And thanks to the team at Provoke Media, our engineer, Kevin Hirschen, and our producer, Elizabeth Severance. Thank you all very much for supporting the show. And thanks to our listeners. Uh, you're really the reason we do this. We've been getting such positive feedback recently from people who listen to the show. Uh, recently got a couple of really positive shout outs on social media, on LinkedIn in particular. That was really gratifying. We put a lot of effort into making the show and finding good guests. Yeah, and we exactly. always want to hear from people who are you know, suggesting new topics and new speakers for us. We're keen to hear about it. 
We do appreciate that. Now, if you uh, are liking the show and you want to help other people find it, the best way to do that, of course, is to give us a five-star review, whether it's on Apple or Spotify or any other podcasting platform. What that does is it just elevates the show in a way that allows other people to discover it and find it. Our growth has been good, and we're really thrilled about that. And we are grateful to our audience uh, of listeners for doing that. So um, we will be back next week with yet another person who is inventing and designing and building and promoting the vision of their future. And until then, Brett, what, we'll when will see we see you again? You <laughs> in the future. <laughs> One day we'll get that right. <laughs> well, that's it for the futurists this week. If you like the show, we sure hope you did. Please subscribe and share it with the people in your community. And don't forget to leave us a five-star review that really helps other people find the show. And you can ping us anytime on Instagram and Twitter at, at Futurist Podcast for the folks that you'd like to see on the show or the questions that you'd like us to ask. Thanks for joining. And as always, we'll see you in the future.